Hello everyone and welcome to Jump Up Supercast, the only podcast on the internet that will be replacing Sony at E3 next year. I'm your host, Will. Joining me today, Brandon. Can't wait for the Konami Pachinko experience in its place. Noah. Uh, we're going to take up the whole floor space, baby. Ills. We're going to have so many games. Saf. I have not thought of any response to this, to be honest with you. You only have 40 <laughs> seconds. And Muzumel. I plan on filling the, our entire booth with just merchandise of myself. <laughs> Get your own little Muzumel plushes. You can punch it and you won't feel bad. <laughs> I, I wouldn't feel bad punching the real thing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, does that mean we're going to have a booth at E3 now? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, having a booth. We're replacing uh, all of Sony's our space. booth. Yeah, we're our taking booth. Sony's space. Um, and I, I've already decided what we're putting there. It's, we're, it's as good as done, to be honest. I'm taking it to the board of directors. Who's but how are we doing this week, boys? Good, good, great. Well, not so great, but I, I'm happy. I'm here because I missed last week, and I was very sad about that. But you know, mm-hmm. I'm here today, and we we have you for a limited time. Yeah, I think. yes, I, so... I, I, I'm. I I will be on a If you hear mission. him mysteriously Yeah, if you hear him mysteriously not mention anything on the list, you know why he disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, he only has himself to blame for the record. Well, That's true. You know, oh, Just yeah. count your blessings. It, it's for the greater good, okay? <laughs> it's for the greater good. Uh, but uh so we'll get right into the news this week and we'll get to the thing that we already alluded to. This is when we are recording this hot off the presses. When you get it, it will be about 4 days old. But uh Sony it's the five-year anniversary of the PlayStation 4 this week, uh, today, by the way, on uh, the Happy 15th birthday. of November. Happy birthday, Happy PS4. Birthday, to PS4. Celebrate. <laughs> to celebrate, we're not going to E3 next year. That's that's how we're <laughs> celebrating this birthday. Oh. Uh, uh, so that happened. So earlier, just to give a little bit of context, earlier in the day, a few people were like, this will be an interesting day. Uh, and I said, what does that mean? And my, our brains went to maybe Sony's gonna talk about next gen maybe they're gonna announce some studios some game then uh we we later found out sort of through the grapevine they might not be at e3 next year and then game informer variety posted the article took it down because i don't think they were supposed to post it when they did then game informer posted it and saying no sony's not at e3 next this year um and i went and i looked i thought okay maybe they're not doing a conference no they're see you later alligator they are not on the show floor they are not bringing games they are not doing any conference in the same time frame because like you know ea is technically not at e3 anymore but they have their own event like half a mile away so it's essentially at e3 you know um sony doesn't seem to be there at all uh which is crazy we've never had one specific publisher especially a major third-party publisher like this go straight from heavy involvement this year at e3 to nothing i mean yeah like all the first parties are at e3 at least have a booth every single year you know Pe- yeah. you know there was like a misnomer around 2013 right people would say oh nintendo's not c- coming to e3 but like they were at e3 you know and they still did a big show for e3 you know even in 2016 they had just zelda but they made it the biggest grandest booth possible you know and uh still made a huge they, they made deal. a disneyland yeah. ride in the middle of e3 you're right uh, uh, sony is just completely just boom we're, we're not showing up we're not doing conference we're not having a booth we're not doing a side event we're not doing like a pre-recorded show. we're not we're just not going to be there and that's crazy that is absolutely crazy yeah i mean it, the word is like it's unprecedented right like there's, yeah. there's not been a company that's done it especially for a first party why do you think that is if you could venture a guess because clearly this doesn't happen for no reason because Sony, um, now the PS4 is five years old, and mm-hmm. Sony said, I don't want to go to Chuck E. Cheese this year anymore. I'm too old for this. Uh, you know, that could I, be it. I, I, I feel like this smacks of, like, hubris. That the PS4 has been the market leader for, you know, the whole generation. And PlayStation has been making bad decisions for a while now. I, like, this just seems like another bad decision. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I think like hubris, Max hubris is the way I would put it, you know? It's like, I don't think, and I think this is such a mistake, I don't think Sony sees uh, Xbox as a competitor. I don't, I, I think they have it in their mind, no matter what we do, like, 
PS5 is we're gonna ride the success, you know. And to be fair, like I think they will. I don't think they're gonna fuck up in any major way, like PS3 or Xbox One did, you know. But like allowing but making, Microsoft to making a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Well. Tr- yeah. And, and just like allowing yeah. Microsoft to constantly get these good headlines, you know, these third-party games are premiering on Xbox, so you just mentally associate them with Xbox, you know. Like it's like like I mean, I'll think of all the third-party games that are just going to be. Because those third-party publishers, they're not going to change their plans to not show up at E3 anymore just because Sony's not there anymore, you know? They need a place to show it. They're going to show it at Microsoft's conference, you know? So it's like... Because the thing to me is, in a lot of ways, this is a lot of chickens coming home to roost a little bit. Uh, Because I would would say the two big contributing factors to this is they, one, made this conscious decision, I think, a couple years ago to really think that E3 is the place to showcase their first-party games. And really nothing else uh, in a major way, at least at least to give a lot of emphasis to it. Uh, And because of that, they felt the need to announce a bunch of games that are that the that the process and the the, like cycle for getting hype for it has been completely messed up. You know, you have Last of Us was announced in 2016. We have a big showcase in 2018, this E3, right? Two years later. And then. It's not coming out till probably holiday 2019, if not maybe a little bit later, yes. right? Like you have that with with uh, Death Stranding, also 2016. You know, Ghost of Tsushima got shown off a year ago. They made a specific point that we this will be a closer announcement to release than most of our games, and it's already been longer than the previous Sucker Punch game, Infinite Se- Second Son, for when it was announced to release, right? And so they were looking at E3 coming up, and they said we don't have any other games to show basically right like next gen is on the horizon if anyone's going into production on new games they're going to be ps5 games not ps4 games so because we already did the big blowout we did 15 minutes of of last of us we did 15 minutes of of uh spider-man you know in multiple years like we don't we don't we can we can we can't just run that back because even this year it wasn't the most well received because of the way they presented it um and so it's it's just it's a lot of issues that are sort of all combining to make the situation where i mean some people are having the take that it's like this is a sign for the death of e3 um i don't think that's the take i think sony will probably be back in 2020 if i were to guess probably i mean it's clear that they're trying to take marketing back into their own uh into their own hands and try to control the pacing of how they want to mm-hmm. distribute news about their games uh I don't know if that's clear. I, I don't agree with that at all because, like, they're clearly just gonna be back at E3 2020. You know, so like any take about oh Sony just wants to do their they're... own thing, like that's not the I'm case not, at all. You I'm know, not saying, I'm not saying that they're gonna be successful. I'm just saying that this. No, no, but I don't even think this is an attempt. I think I, I just fundamentally disagree that this is even an attempt at that. I think this is just flat out. They messed up the pace of their announcements throughout this generation. You know, and the fact of the matter is. They nowadays they like their E three showings. They like their presentations to be mostly about the first party games, right? Uh, the first party games, PS five. It's too early to show. All you can show is Ghost of Tsushima, Death Stranding, Last of Us Part two. We saw gameplay of all these last year. It's not going to make an impact two years in a row. You know, it's just like more of the same. There's so it's like there's there's really nothing to show. That's all it is. They don't have anything to show yeah. next year, flat out. I mean, it, it's sort of like. Because to their like you know there are other companies that like will do I mean Nintendo will do conferences where they do a huge big blowout in one game right which is sort of what Sony's strategy was this year but split among the three but like imagine if you had the big blowout on Super on Smash Brothers this year but Smash still wasn't out by E3 2019 imagine how how bad having to have two E3s be dedicated twenty minutes of each to showing off this one game that we've already seen a ton of that wouldn't that wouldn't be received well right. And so I think that they're aware of that and they're, they're making this play to, I mean, I think the other thing this, this shows, it, it has a lot of like ripple effects. One, it feels like PS4, PS5 is definitely isn't 2020 at this point, right? Yeah, no, no, like, no. Like PS5 is 2020. Probably shown. 100%. Yeah, probably, PS5 is 2020. Yeah, or announced at least. I just, yeah. I guess uh, right now I'm wondering is like those three games, are they cross-gen at this point? You know, which I think it would be disappointing if a majority of these three are cross-gen, you know? Like, I will accept yeah, one of these, probably. but if, like, all three or even two are crossed in, I'm, like, kind of like, eh, like, why the fuck did you announce this in 2016 then, you know? Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Right. Well, I mean, it's, the thing is, 
Sony's definitely got to have, even if they're not cross-gen, they might do like an upscale thing where, yeah. I mean, because PS5 has to be backwards compatible. Yeah. Mm. Right. Because I, it would be such a, it would be such a mistake for it not to be. Especially I mean, I wouldn't they, put it past them to make that mistake, but go Well, on. I don't think they're going to make that mistake with how Xbox is running things now. You hope. <laughs> Well, and the, the thing is, like, generally they've been pretty, like, you know, PS1 to PS2 to PS2 to PS3, they, like, they had it in there. The issue was that the cell architecture was just so strange with the PS3, there was no way to emulate it if you didn't just have the cell architecture, like, another PS3 basically stuck inside the PS4. So, like, I think that it, but I, I would, I would, I would expect them to probably have backwards compatibility. The PS3 was already messed up, wasn't it, with the PS2? Like, it didn't. Work it that did all some well. games it did but, like yeah. some games but not all of them and then like later yeah. it got removed period which sometimes happens i mean yeah. last week we were talking about how the the uh one of this um what the fuck ps classic yeah the ps classic and one of those dudes saying why would anybody want to play those old games like don't you see yeah. like kind of a contradiction there like, i would think, I, I think it's that, just, uh, just backwards compatibility would be a sure thing from the reporting on it, it's just like, it seems like the PS5 is going to have a very similar architecture to the PS4, so probably making it backwards compatible would be a lot more easy than it would be for a lot of other uh, generational jumps. So, like, but, I mean, sort of back to the E3 thing, like, because I think that it reflects on that writ large, like Brandon was sort of saying that Sony might feel pressured to backwards compatibility because of how Microsoft's been doing it. This leaves, I feel like, just a huge open space for Microsoft to step in, Right. Oh, absolutely. Oh, well, I hope so. Yeah. And I, I, I hope they take that opportunity. You know, I want them to come out swinging, you know, um, because I, I, it, it, they're built, this is their chance to build up a lot of goodwill for next gen, you know? And I, I feel like Sony mm. not realizing that is a huge mistake, you know? It's like, like they, they are perfectly planting the seeds right now for people to be excited about the next Xbox. And, I don't know how Sony just doesn't see that, you know? It's not even about them not being E3. It's about letting Microsoft take advantage of that, you know? It's just crazy, ludicrous yeah, to me. Yeah, Microsoft is probably going to steal the show, like, at, 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 Especially yeah. when it comes to, like, if you think about it, like, PlayStation has the content to be able to have a press conference still, you know? they Like, because Microsoft's conference was basically just third-party games this year, you know? Um, Sony could easily do that, but they don't have an interest in showing anything outside of their first party. They definitely don't have any interest showing any sort of indie games that aren't VR, you know? Uh, they just don't care. And that about, makes no sense. They don't care about smaller scale content, which is, which, it, it, like, it irritates me because, like, at the beginning of the gen, they were all about indies. They were all about smaller content. And that's part of why I liked PS4 so much. And for them to now just kind of shrug it off, it's like, eh, like, well, you're not worth being in the main show. Undertale, you're in the pre-show. Tetris Effect, we'll announce you on the PlayStation blog before the E3 showing. You know? It's like, these games would make for great E3 announcements, but, like, Sony just doesn't see it that way anymore. And, you know, they're only in this play, in this position because of themselves, you know? And, I, like, I wholeheartedly yeah, it's believe... It's almost a self-imposed yeah, situation, right? Yeah, because I wholeheartedly believe after 2019, like, you know, they'll catch up, and af after that, like, 2020, like, you know, They'll have content to announce. They can go back to having conferences, whatever, you know? But, like, in the meantime, like, yeah. 2019, like, it, they announced these games way too fucking early. They don't want to show smaller games anymore. They don't want to show, like, other kinds of third-party games anymore. Like, this is, like, this is just years of stupid mistakes by them just adding up, you know? And that's, that's listen, what the end result if, is. If they don't even have their own games to show, what the fuck is the harm in showing off other people's games? Yeah, that's, that. that, that's exactly yeah, that, my I mean, thing, you know? Like, and because like literally every third party game known to man comes to PlayStation, you know? So it's like <laughs> there's myriad of yeah. games to show. The, there are games that are casual exclusives on it that like are Persona 5, right? That's that's only on PS4. Dragon Quest is a, is a console exclusive for the time being. You know, uh, Near Automata was that too for a long time. Like there are games that are essentially exclusives that you can give a highlight to. Those are bigger scale games. There's also indie games too. You know, like there is a conference they could make very easily while still showing a new trailer for Last of Us, a new trailer for you know, goes to Tsushima, but not doing these big 15 minute blowouts and making a decent show of it, but they seem uninterested. And I think that, you know, I don't know if it comes from him, but you know, you listen to what the executives are saying. And Sean Layden is a guy who is so 
into his the, the idea of Sony as a first party publisher making their own games. He's he talks about that constantly, you know, like and they sort of had that that feeling themselves this year at E3 in a, in a big way, right? Where he was literally like, "Hey, we're in a church. I'm talking to the congregation right now about to show you the video games." And it's like, you know, when you go and you end up doing that stuff and not letting anyone else in, you only end up making yourself look closed off. I don't even know, you know, once again, in terms of what will be on the system, that won't be affected by this stuff, but perception is king in the final years of a console's life cycle, right? Because that's when it starts paying forward to the next generation. Yeah, and it just um, seems like they're doing damage to their own brand or their own community. Like, why would you do this? Yeah. I just want to harp um, on one point again that I made. I just want to, like, expand upon one thing, though. Is like, if you look at, like, the pace of first-party releases they've had over the course of a generation, you know, I can easily envision where if they had just, you know, planned things better, even with the slate they have, they could have, uh, you know, announced these things properly, you know? Like, Horizon Zero Dawn, I think, had a perfect reveal to release, you know? God of War, great, you know? Like, two E3s and you're good, you know? Um, if they had waited just another year to show off Spider-Man, that could have been last year's big thing, you know? This year's big thing could have been Ghost of Tsushima rather than showing it, uh, uh, what is it called? showing it last Paris Games Week, you know? And then next E3, next E3 really is when The Last of Us should have been announced. The Last of Us was announced way too early. If they had just done like one to two major announcements every E3, you know, first party wise, and then have PSX be about the smaller content, about Japanese games, about indie games, like stuff like that, you know? Like that, that would have been a perfect cadence, you know, of like E3 is where, where we announce one or two big Sony first party games. PSX is for the smaller stuff, and you just go back and forth, and for the fan favorites, you know, you just go back and forth like that. Yeah. Like it's just that they had way too many conferences. They felt the need to announce Last of Us and Dead Stranding way too early, and it's just all these things added up, you know, and it's frustrating. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is that like when you do self-impose this idea of we're going to still do conferences every year, we're going to still have them be mainly first party. That's going to happen. That's it's you know it's the thing that like the. We, we haven't had as many directs in the Switch era where there was, like, not a big announcement because now the Switch era has more third parties, so you can sort of bolster a direct with third-party announcements while having one or two Nintendo games announced along the way, right? And, like, that happens more frequently than these conferences do, but it's just whenever you have to be your own... It'd be an island, essentially. Like, Nintendo has a ton of internal teams. Sony has fewer, just numerically. And even Nintendo has trouble with that, right? There would be years where they would just have nothing, you know, back in the Wii U and 3DS era. And so it's it's a very strange, like, self in, self-enforced, self like, weight to bear that is paying off in this big situation where, like, E3 has as many eyes on it as, as it has ever had before. You know, like, the memberships on Twitch go up every year. They don't go down. Uh, so this idea that that it's weaker than it used to be, that, that you know, E3 is a dying conference, it's like... In That's some just ways, damage control. Sure. That, but like, it's just damage control. Like, I'm just going to call it out for what yeah. it is. Because the fact is, like, you have your eyes on you on E3. Like, we Twitch and the, the, the metrics we've seen from Twitch and YouTube, especially in the last two, three years, is like, people, all eyes are on the gaming industry during E3, you know? And people are consuming all this content all week long, you know? Like, the, Twitch always puts out these crazy stats of, like, 10,000 million hours watched during E3, you know? And it's just like, yeah. this idea that, oh, E3 is just not relevant anymore. Like, that that's not true, you know? Like, I get from, like, probably from the journalist side of things, like, yeah, maybe, like, actually physically being in a press conference actually doesn't really matter anymore, right? Like, we, everyone probably could just do their yeah. own fan. But just having eyes on you during that week is so much, you know? So many yeah. people are tuning in what they don't usually. And it's like, yeah. So this, well, this, like for years, it's like this uh, sense of like perceived loss of uh, status of E3. It's been going on for a long time, but it's uh, it, it's always been important to us. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, it, it's like it, baseball. You know, every year people say baseball's dying. Baseball's dying. Baseball's dying. But it's still there. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah, it's, it's it's it still gets a huge number of viewership. Even you know, compared to every other event, it's just it's not as big as it once was. Yeah. But like E three, even you know, like I mean, sort of like Els was saying, like it's it's often discussed as being this dying thing. But there is there is 
I don't know of another industry thing where every single like movie production studio doesn't come to one convention hall and all show off their big trailers for their new movies. You know, that doesn't happen for any other industry. And that's something that is unique to the games industry and, and makes it part of E3 the fun of that is that like it is everyone is here. And so when suddenly one of the big three is just missing, that loss will be felt by everyone that is watching, which it won't go down probably, right? Like you just won't have people on your eyes looking at your games and that's not good for you. Yeah. Um, you just got to kind of feel for like any Sony fans who are looking forward to them being there. Yeah. I mean, even just like us, like, you know, like, you know, so many people just love to watch E3, right? Like we're like, even like we like to watch E3 conferences that don't even necessarily interest us. Right. And she's like, it sucks that like yeah. one less conference, like there's the three big ones. Like, let's be honest, like, yeah, Ubisoft and Bethesda and all of them have their conferences, right? But like, we're looking forward to the three, yeah. the big three, you know? And having that of taken course. away, like that yeah. lessens our E3 viewing experience. And that kind of sucks. Just on a personal note, you know? We're going to have Microsoft on Sunday, then Nintendo on Tuesday. And it's just going to feel like a big old gap is missing in the middle. Because even <laughs> shitty E3s, uh, you know, it's just like, those are still fun. <laughs> you know at its core this, this, just for this. us on a selfish note you know it, well also yeah in the memes yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy played the flute this year what was going on um yeah think about the weird. memes sony you Come gotta on. do it for the that's memes. the biggest disappointment yeah and and like i mean and on a more like kind of taking off that point but like somewhat seriously sony's the only one that would sell tickets or not sell tickets you you, you could go to a movie theater and watch their conference right like that was part of it uh, and it's, and it's, it's, it's sort of gone now. Like that, that thing of like, Hey, come watch us. Wait, uh, people did that. I don't think, I don't think they sold tickets. I think <laughs> no, no, you just go. I'm sorry. I will correct that. You can, you can, but like there would be theaters where they would, you could just sit in attendance and watch with other people. Like, yeah. And that's fun. That's, that's a thing that people would do. And you're like, well, that's gone now. Right. Like, you know, it may not have been me because it would be like an hour and a half drive, but like there was an audience of people that I know, like that would that are that we're excited on making that an event every year and that's that's just gone now too right and like there's no psx this december like they are radio silent for the next year probably in terms of conferences and that's that's just weird for for any company especially one that was doing three conferences a year for most of the generation yeah so yeah so i don't know like maybe we'll maybe they'll have some secret thing after e3 like in august maybe that's when they start talking about next generation stuff who knows but uh, yeah, I want to talk about that because it's it's gonna have a resounding effect through like I think the rest up until E three of next year, like with how games are announced, where they go to get announced, like it's just missing now. Resident Evil two was announced at Sony this year. We don't know where it'll be now. Uh, the, you know the mm. next Capcom game. Um, so we'll I find mean, out. I know where it'll be. <laughs> yeah, Microsoft. Microsoft. Uh, yeah. Also, I mean Capcom. Come on, have your own takeover. Take advantage. Oh, yes. Let's do it. Do it, Capcom. Capcom. <laughs> Believe. Uh, I, mean, they, I like that. They have all the IPs for it, but they just don't need to fuck up again. Yeah. Man, it's weird to that, that Resident Evil 2 is going to be in January, by the way. That's just a crazy thing. Uh, I can't wait. Yeah. These video games are still exciting. Uh, but you know what else is exciting? Speaking of just weird things, we got a trailer for a movie this week. Yeah. Normally we don't talk about movies because this is a video games podcast. Oh, we did talk about movie before. We talked about yeah, like how to how to adapt a video game into a movie. Well, now we now we have an example of how they did it. Yeah. Detective Pikachu, excuse me, Pokemon colon Detective Pikachu, <laughs> starring Ryan Reynolds as Pikachu <laughs> is out, yeah. and I remember reading about it. Uh, Ryan Reynolds is going to be Detective Pikachu. I thought that'll be a weird movie. I watched it. Uh, my brain didn't really comprehend just how weird it would be. Uh, <laughs> when I first saw this, I thought it was like a fan trailer. I was like, oh, this is pretty high quality. Holy shit. And yeah. then I realized it was actually a legit Pokemon Detective Pikachu movie. I was like, oh. Oh. I want to watch well, this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've known about the movie. Like, you know, I've been following along with, you know, articles about the movie coming and, you know, that Ryan Reynolds was going to be in it for a while now. And I also heard, you know, a, a day or two before the trailer got released, there was, you know, rumbles on the internet of, oh, that Detective Pikachu trailer is coming soon. And then when I f saw that it was out and I watched it, man, I was not what I expected at all. Jigglypuff is hairy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's weird. So weird. 
<laughs> well, yeah. oh, weird thing. It's just, it's just, it's so. Hard. But I, but here's the thing, right? You, you one, uh, it's actually like it's, it's gotten a lot of attention. It's at over like 35 million views probably by the time you're hearing this. It's more views than the Toy Story 4 announcement. What a world we live in. That's yeah, crazy. Um, but I've rewatched it like five times now, and every time I watch it, I'm like more and more into the movie. It's a weird <laughs> thing. It's, it's. They're not going for a Pokemon look, right? They're going like their Pikachu is like clearly fuzzy. He like looks uh, I maybe more rat like. I don't know. Like it's hard to describe the look of it. Mr. Mime is there. He has dodgeballs for shoulder pads. And like you can see the pores and freckles on his skin. It is Pokemon. You've never seen Mr. Mime look like this before. Uh I never want to look at Mr. Mime. <laughs> It's, I mean, I kind of, I was talking to Brent about this. I kind of love that they, that like, it's, it's a shockingly good trailer. That's part of it. It's like the movie doesn't look terrible, which no. you would think that maybe it might be, but like it, it, just the editing of it. Like you, you see Pikachu first, you hear the, the voice of Ryan Reynolds come out of it. Then you see, you hear for one second, the normal Pika Pika. And then it's back to Ryan Reynolds and you're like, oh, that's the thing I know. Oh, it's, we're weird again. We're back to being weird. Here's Mr. Mime. He's looking weird. It's, uh, I, I guess I just wanted to say this is a wild thing and it's, I'm kind of love it. <laughs> yeah, same. And the humor yeah. honestly seems pretty good. Mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't, it's not like cringy in, in the way where, you know, a lot of, you know, obviously this movie is Pokemon, right? So, you know, it, everybody's going, it's good. It's for kids. It's for not going to have it's a lot Pokemon. of swearing. Yeah. Damn. But, <laughs> they also, I think, you know, Pokemon fans, I think I said this to Will, we were talking about it. Um, I said, this movie seems like it's made by Pokemon fans so that it seems like it has got more love than you would, you would think. Like where a Hollywood exec would say, hey, what's popular? Let's grab this and make a movie out of it. And then it ends up becoming like a lifeless shell of what, you know, it actually is. Like it's just a cash grab. Mm -hmm. This doesn't seem like that. It it seems good. I remember Red and I used uh, were looking over the poster for this uh, movie, and we we're all picking out all the references that they have to Pokemon or like Pokemon related stuff. Like, there's a lot of attention to detail that's yes. being passed on to this movie. Just in yeah. that movie poster alone, there's a lot of cool references yeah. in that. I we were going through it, and it was fun. In that opening shot of that trailer too, there's a ton of it, and that's part of the things I I like about it is that like I was really worried it was going to be all Gen 1 Pokemon, right? Like, yeah, here, you know, here's the ones that, you know them from the when you were a kid. Uh, oh, Lord. And, uh -huh. uh, but, like, you know, there's 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 a fair number of Gen 1s in there, but then you see, like, Greninja's in there, Mor Morlul from Gen 7, Braviary from Gen 5. Like, you know, it, it it is a cool thing to see, uh, like, a, a, a well-realized world that has Pokemon in it. Like, just in the background, there's, like, a little, sh like, a little... A stall that's selling like noodles or whatever in a shot and you see that Charmander has his little tail under the pot and it's he's using his fire on his tail to heat up the pot and you're like oh that's great I love that like no one called that out it's like look at this thing and look at this thing in the movie it's just in the background it's like a little like hey this world exists as Pokemon in it look at how the Pokemon and the people live together that's all I want as like a as a as a five-year-old playing Pokemon you know gold on my game hmm. boy that's like the that's a dream thing for me so um some of these pokemon like at first i thought they were a bag of nightmares but then i kind of got used to it like especially with jigglypuff and uh mr mine but after looking at a trailer again like a lot of these pokemon are really cool like i love i love how cute pikachu is and i love how fucking menacing charizard turned out to be as well like they they've designed them yeah well <laughs> my episode. That final shot is just Charizard about to eat Pikachu, and you're like, dang, Pokemon are going <laughs> to eat each other in this movie, maybe. Uh-oh, Pikachu's going to live, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, that's that's cool. Uh, see, I just want to talk about it because we, we had the discussion earlier on, months ago, about how to adapt these movies, and we also said, hey, like, don't, don't like, go one-to-one -one from the movie, from you from the game, but, like, keep the spirit of it. And I think they actually did a good yeah. job of that. I'm, uh, I'm very excited for this movie. Yeah. Next summer, it's going to be a good time with Toy Story in this movie. I want to know a movie. Is, sorry, I really that is know. not that is not. What do that. you? What do you? What Pokemon do you want to see in this movie adapted? Diggersby. Where, Lord? 
A whale lord in the harbor, just a giant whale lord, like <laughs> yeah. huge. I would love that. That would be pretty cool. Diggersby be cool. might be upsetting, but I would want him there. Incineroar, because he should be in everything now. He's good. <laughs> I would love Incineroar. Yeah, that'd be great. This I, I want to see. I, I wonder if we'll see any ghost types. I wonder if they'll have to like try to like come to terms oh, with the idea be. of a ghost existing in this world with like real people and like how that. I, yeah. Yeah. Mask. Hunter and Gengar gotta be there. Show me a yeah mask with an actual person's face for the mask and making it truly frightening. Ooh, that'd be very cool. Um, yeah. So, so. Oh, speaking of movies that aren't doing that though, Chandelure. Uh, <laughs> I changed my mind. There we go. That's a fair pick. Actually, that would be amazing. Have you guys seen the the set of anything from the set of Monster Hunter the movie? Really quickly. No, uh, I, I saw. No, but I haven't heard good things. <laughs> It is set in what appears to be modern day Afghanistan, and they're all straight up like U.S. military with SMGs. Why? And like assault oh, no. rifles. Why? It is. All the fantasy of Monster Hunter is gone from this movie. I don't know why. I mean, I know why. why? It's because it's the same people that did the Resident Evil movies, right? So, like. And, oh, well, that's fucked. Never yeah. mind. Because human uh, beings are the real monsters. It's true. Makes you think. Wow. Metaphors. Um. Yeah, so that's a, maybe don't look up those pictures if you don't want to feel sad. Uh, but before we finish up on the news, uh, actually, we have two things. One, hit this really fast. We talked about it before a couple months ago. The Microsoft announced XO18, uh, the fan event. They had it. Uh, they later clarified that it would be an in, inside Xbox show, which uh, should have tempered expectations. It, it did at least for me. So, which is just essentially that they have announcements. But it's never anything super huge. Uh, so yeah. I'll sort of hit the big things of it. This was a two hour long, in a lot of ways, a two hour long uh, advertisement for Game Pass, which isn't a bad thing. Uh, they announced 17 different games that are coming to Game Pass in the next two months. I think 10 of them were live the day of. Uh, whenever you want, your first month of Game Pass will be a dollar. So if you ever, if there's ever an Xbox game coming out, just get Game Pass for that month. You'll get that that first party Xbox game for a buck essentially, which is crazy. Um, they announced a game called Void Bo Void Bastards, which look it up. It's by not the guy who not the guy you've heard of, but the other guy who worked on Bioshock. Uh, and it looks very cool. Um, and finally, they confirmed that they were going to buy Obsidian, which was rumored. We talked about also on this podcast, but now written in stone. Um, they also bought in exile who is a company that worked on wasteland if you've ever heard of those games the bard's tale they're very hardcore niche role-playing games that are on the pc obsidian it's very similar sort of thing and they said uh we're we were when we are being acquired we were said that the goal is still to look at ourselves as pc first and foremost um which i think is interesting that that sort of microsoft isn't saying hey we're making you make these xbox games that we you know that that aren't a fit for you they want them to keep playing to their strong suits, which I like. So um, I would not watch the two hour version of that XO18 show. It dragged a lot. <laughs> so, but uh, there's the recap for you. Yeah. They announced some DLC, I think, and stuff too yeah. for different games. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, Sea of Thieves got, got a new mode that is multiplayer, uh, co competitive, like structured more so than the actual game is. Uh, Death Stranding, not Death Stranding. Lord have mercy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's the what's the one, boy? That tells you how it is. Sato Decay Two. There we go. Is getting an expansion. A bunch of first party <laughs> games basically, um, are getting expansions because, of course, they are. What's um, the um? What's the difference between Game Pass and Games with Gold? Games with Gold is so you you pay the you pay for online with game with Games with Gold, right? That's and essentially it's just, the Games with Gold is just a thing that comes with paying for online. Game Pass is a separate service you can get. Uh, that is ten dollars a month normally, and it has I think they're up to like a hundred and seventy five games um, <laughs> uh, now uh, that are all on the service as long as you have the service, you can download them to your system and just play them um, much and, as you want yeah and, download and, delete, download, delete, do whatever you want. those games are basically yours as long as you're paying ten dollars a month each. yeah. And they are every single first party game on Xbox is coming day one with Game Pass. So that's a, that's a thing we've uh, speaking of Crackdown three got moved up actually about a yeah, month. February 15th, February 15th. 
Um, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Ha- ha- grab your loved one and sit down and play some Crackdown multiplayer because that got shown off. They, the cloud has finally finished making Crackdown 3, and you can destroy the buildings in multiplayer. It looks pretty cool. Uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So that's that's a lot of, of the sort of broad strokes of XO18. Uh, but, boys, we let's have a little conversation, a little reminiscing, because an old, an old ally, I guess we can say, passed away this week. Prima Games shut down. Famous for making strategy guides uh, for nearly, I think, two decades. Uh, pretty good run, all things considered, but they were sort of the last one standing in a lot of ways that were not official companies making these strategy guides. Um, yeah. and, and they're, they're gone now. And I just wanted, wanted to have a conversation about strategy guides because they're a thing that kids growing up today won't have, they're, Ugh. uh, which is Rest in some ways sad. Yeah. In some, yeah. Oh no, it's just hitting me now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like I, it, it hit me earlier this week, but now it's really hitting me because where am I going to buy my Pokédex books? Where are you going to buy your Pokédex books? My favorite ones. Those were my favorite ones. Like the ones like they would come out with the Pokémon strategy guide, and that was great mm-hmm. and all. But then they would have the Pokédex that was just a big old fucking book of every single Pokémon, mm-hmm. their stats, what moves they learn, what levels mm-hmm. they learn them, their egg moves, the mm-hmm. TMs oh, shit. And they can learn, it was like sick. everything. And like nice paper too. Like you yeah. would get a strategy guys sometimes it would feel oh, it would feel low yeah. quality or high quality. When you get a high quality baby, you're like, I'm taking this on a road trip. I'm going to read mm-hmm. this on the way to the beach instead of reading my it's book just, for school. Yeah, there's so much cool info in them and just the maps the maps are like nothing else that's the you thing. look up a guide on the internet now and it's just text maybe yeah. with a p- couple pictures attached you know if it's game facts it's just text if it's uh like an ign guide maybe they'll attach a video but damn it i don't want to watch a video mm-hmm. right i want to do it myself if i want to watch a video i might as well watch a fucking let's play yeah like I, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't like it. I like when they would have just like the map of the entire area, you know, and there'd be legend and, you know, showing you where each and everything is mm-hmm. and, you know, stuff like that is super cool to look at and there would be artwork around it and yeah, man, it was so yeah. cool. That yeah, was that, the thing is it's like a good strategy. Got, sorry, go ahead, Els. I was just going to say, yeah, they, they were generally, generally very pretty and uh, they, mm-hmm. they sort of felt like collectibles. Like, yeah. you just kind of, like, had them. Because they were always, like, really gorgeous to look at when you saw them in the stores. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and in some ways, they could, like, almost elevate a game, right? Like, that was the thing, is, like, you sort of view it like this companion piece. Like, yeah. I remember with Black and White, I, I, got the, I got the Pokedex book with it. And that Black and White, of course, was the game that had all new Pokemon, right? Yeah. And so there was something fun about, like, I catch the Pokemon, I see it, and, I, like, I like I flip open the book, and I would turn to it, and I'd be like, oh, it's this type. Oh, look at this guy. This is, like, this This is cool, right? Like, I wouldn't I wouldn't mm-hmm. read too much because I wanted to have a little bit of surprises in store. But, like, yeah. just that, that thing of turning and, like, physically flipping a page to look at these things and, like, having, like you said, sometimes it was hard. It's, it's actually hard to write a strategy guide. I remember... The guy who wrote the Earthbound strategy guide, which famously went with the game when it was released, yeah. uh, wrote about it and wrote about the presenting of it. Because that Earthbound strategy guide is one of the greats. It's that's in, a yeah. It's, it's one all of the best strategy guides ever. Yeah, it's all presented as like as like a travel book for Eagle mm-hmm. Land, and like here's different yeah. things you can do, and like local cu- cuisine uh, cuisine includes X Y Z things, and like that's what's in the store, and you're like, oh, like, and he was saying, you know, I wanted to work really hard to not spoil things if you ran ahead, but to excite you for what was to come. And I remember sometimes having that where I would flip through a thing in a store and I would like see a picture of like what was going to happen later on, and I wouldn't know what the context was, but I'd be like, I want to get there. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. and now with you know a lot of that mystique is gone uh, with like you Brandon like like you said Brandon like watching just a, a four minute video where here's exactly how you do it and just recreate it on your own screen you know like that's... yeah I don't like that that's not that's not what I want mm-hmm. like you know I, if I'm stuck in a puzzle I I want to read like you know I don't know just like a, a, here's a map and you move these in this order like it's just you're, you're still doing it yourself and playing it out on your own end. It's just, I don't know. If you just watch a video, it's okay. I'm going to now do exactly what I watched. It's, yeah, yeah, it's just not as good. And something about the strategy guides that I really always appreciated too was they would almost like 
like you said, a, be a companion piece, but like they would add more to the game a lot because not only did they tell you like, okay, like here's how to play through the game. They would have all these cool things like character bios and a uh, backstory that you might not even have got in the game that you mm-hmm. could read up on. Yeah. You know, interesting things in, in, um, you know, there would be like the controls, but then there'd be like advanced techniques, you know, stuff that, you know, experts would write on that you could learn how to play the game even better. Yeah, right. stu- it was really interesting shit in there. Yeah, and I I found like it was even interesting to look at games like even the ones that I hadn't even played like just because it gives you like such a flavor for the game that that you're looking at that you're reading about. So yeah. I thought that was that was really cool. And also like anytime you beat a game and you wanted to go back to make sure you know you didn't miss anything or if there's like cool stuff you might have missed out on. Yeah, yep. that was always like uh, a great way to use those books. Yeah, Metroid Prime Player's Guide, my one of my favorite ones ever that I ever had. You know, help me just one hundred percent that game, hundred and one percent, I think. <laughs> the numbers get really weird with the percentages in that, but let's say one hundred and one percent. Just yeah, <laughs> just take a guess there. Uh, yeah, I mean that's and like I sort of want to just talk about that in general, like. There is something, I think, that, that has been lost with just the amount of... I mean, I think in a lot of ways, having access to inter- information is good overall. But there is yeah. something, I think, that is um, that is lost that was once there of, like, how information about a game was a commodity, almost, to be traded, and, like, that, that, and that you would engage with, right? I mean, like, we, I'm sure we've all had the schoolyard thing of someone making up some way to get, you know, like <laughs> Mew and Pokemon, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. always. here's this secret thing in this game where if you beat this level this many times, it'll unlock a secret thing. And sometimes, and most of the time that wasn't true, but like the one out of a dozen times where it was, your mind was blown. You're like, this is the video games are magic. How many right? times did you hear about uh, being able to resurrect Aerith in uh, Final Fantasy seven? <laughs> Like, yeah never honestly well, but like not you but but like <laughs> there was something about like even though that wasn't true even though you couldn't do it th- that question mark would like would, would get your brain running wild you know and you and you would think about that game so much and i feel like now oftentimes with games we can we we get them we read about them before they come out we we rush through them and then we move on what's the next thing right and so i, and I think that part of that is that because we can blow through these games because there is um you know just it's very hard to get stuck in a modern video game, right? Just because of all the accesses, ways that we can figure out ways to get through it. Um, yeah. And I think that's why, like, people get attached to games like Dark Souls or, like, even Breath of the Wild. Like, I mean, it's been a year and a half or almost two years now, so I'm not going to feel too bad. But, like, I didn't know that there were dragons in that game until one of them was just magically flying by me in the lake. And I was like, what? What is this giant creature? This is incredible, right? Like that type of stuff doesn't happen much anymore in video games, and and strategy guides sort of, I think, played into the culture that that allowed that sense of mystery to exist um, in a way that that I that I still love. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I don't know. Like, there's no there's no grand point about like how to bring back strategy guides or anything. Just a a little little moment to reminisce, I suppose. Yeah, I'll miss them, and I hope. There's when Gen Eight comes out. I hope there's a Pokedex somehow, some way. I, I th- I'm sure. I'm, I have to believe that Nintendo will will find some way to do that because it's Nintendo Power used to make the dopest fucking players guides they did. of all they time. Did. It was fucking they were awesome. Sick. Oh, They're man. so good. They used to always give one away every time when you would uh, resubscribe. Mm-hmm. Which goddamn, what a fucking deal! Nintendo Power yeah, it was. It was like Sick. twenty bucks for a fucking year of Nintendo Power, mm-hmm. and you get a free player's guide yeah. when you subscribe. Holy shit! You just basically bought a player's guide and got twelve months of sub- subscription for free. And that and and, the, and at that time you couldn't just go on IGN and like get a million thing every single day, right? Like you would get actual like cool games that were being highlighted by Nintendo Power. That's a whole yeah. other conversation, oh, damn, but I, I love it. I uh, love it. I miss Nintendo Power too, but yeah. So uh, that is. You know, we, we reminisce about players' guides. Now let's look back to games that came out before on the list. 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 The list. Brandon. Yes, my friend. It's your moment. I know I, this is maybe one of those open secret situations, but there's a game I know you've been chomping at the bit to put on the list. Mm-hmm. Well, it's all falling apart, apparently, because, you know, uh, 
Everybody's dying around me. We can manage. <laughs> you are the Kirby <laughs> of us. But it's been over a year now since a certain game came out. And we have, if you don't know about the list, and also you can follow along at Pace Bin in the description below. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and if you don't know about the list itself, uh, we where we rank the video games, uh, we do have a simple rule that you can't place a game on the list unless it's been out for a year. Mm-hmm. Are we really doing this? Yeah, we are. <laughs> I thought we weren't going to do this. No. We're, we're, we're doing this. We're doing oh, this geez. right now. So this game recently just passed the year mark. Mm-hmm. And I love it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's time. To put it on the list. And that game is Super Mario Odyssey. He didn't swerve us, uh, folks. Here we go. Yay. Off the rails. What the fuck don't are you, you doing? No, it's time to raise our sails. It's the game that gave us the namesake. We, of this we named this podcast after that song in the game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, Brandon. Yeah. Obviously, uh, you have the right to both discuss this game and rank it wherever you would see fit to begin the conversations. Talk to us about Super Mario Odyssey. Well, Super Mario Odyssey, I mean, I was very excited for this game when it first got announced. I mean, it looked great. Mm -hmm. It looked like a return to form for for Mario. Although, you know, because we had had great 3D Marios. Mm -hmm. Really great 3D Mm -hmm. Marios, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine. It had the, the those two games had big open world kind of like exploration. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when Galaxy came out, Galaxy is fucking incredible. Yeah, yeah. So not to take anything away ever from Galaxy, especially Galaxy Two, which even was better. Uh, but those games took a a little bit away from the exploration that uh, Mario 64 and Sunshine had. It yeah. wasn't as open world. There's more level. Yeah, based. it's weird because like. You go into all these different planets and like they were literally in space going from place to place, but it didn't yeah. feel like it's weird. You like you weren't exploring like different worlds. You were just exploring rocks in space, you know what I mean? Yeah, well the, some of them were planets, some were bigger planets yeah. than others and No, they were, they, yeah, yeah. But it, like they were level based more than anything. Yeah, you know? yeah they were exactly. Linear. That's, more linear, yeah. Right? There wasn't like, like open more world more. exploration, check the level out, it's like every yeah. nook and cranny of like a little yeah. pebble under the rock. Secret, yeah. There's obviously secrets to be had and this and that. But yeah, so they kind of stu- took took a step away from that. A little bit, you know, not bad at all. And, you know, because those games mm-hmm. were fucking incredible. Uh, and then, you know, then we got Super Mario 3D World. Also a very good game, but even even made it more linear than ever yeah. before. You know, they took the 3D land formula, made it very streamlined, classic Mario, get it from point A to point B um, with a little bit of, you know, 3D, you know, kind of go, you know, it's not necessarily side scrolling, but, you know, mm-hmm. um, Get from point A to point B, really, for every level. That's all. All really, the goal was ever. Mm-hmm. So was, when I when they announced this game, uh, it, you know, I was excited because oh damn, this is like a return to form, like Mario sixty four was, and it just the worlds, the vibrant energy, everything I saw, it, and then when the game finally came out, it just I already had big expectations for this game and it blew it away. Mm -hmm. Like I was just, Mm -hmm. I didn't like, I feel like I didn't stop smiling the whole time I was playing the game. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for, I was sad when it was like, I was sad when I beat it. Cause I was like, damn, I want more. I mean, luckily there is more. There's a lot more. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to this game. Yeah. It's a, it's a big game too. It's, there's a lot to do and it's a lot of fun. It's Mm -hmm. just, Mm -hmm. just playing the game is fun. It's literally just, what you want when you play a video game? Yeah, on it's, a on a fundamental you're just level, having fun. Yeah, it is just j- joyous to play the game. Yeah, yeah, everything about it, and and then just the worlds were all so varied, and and they were all like brand new. You know, like it wasn't like places we've been before. Uh, you know, here's a Mario world you've visited. You mm-hmm. know, the, this is a grass world. Here's the the ice world. Here's the you know, the things that Mario 3D World did, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's just, you know, it, this is the standard Mario stuff. Yeah. But none of it was standard Mario at all. But it still felt like Mario. Yeah. It was familiar, you know? but it felt very fresh. Yes. Yeah. It did. 
so we can talk more about this, I think. But where do you, where do you, let's let's start to frame the conversation. Where you would like to put it on the list? I think <laughs> easily top five. Okay, without a doubt in my mind. All right, easily. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yeah, for sure. I'd put this game right now. <sighs> this is tough. <laughs> this is why <laughs> we do want to do this. Toes. All right. I, I, right now, I'm gonna say three. Okay. I w- while. <laughs> While he is dead, he continues to haunt us. Muzamil, as he was dying, gave me an affidavit because Muzamil has, and we have had frequent arguments with him over Mario Odyssey, and he wants to have a few of his thoughts aired out. So if you would allow us to do a brief moment. What in- the hell is this shit? <clears throat> Hello, dear podcast listeners. If you're reading this, <laughs> it means Brandon's locked me in a janitor's closet in an attempt to silence my voice on this important topic. But here are the facts that I would like to desire. He did not, re- he did not write that. He did. No. Super wow. Mario Odyssey. Now, I'm sure Brandon has mentioned all the great things about oh, this game. And in God. fairness, there's a lot of good things to say. But here is some important information I would like to be heard. First off, <laughs> there's no actual platforming challenges in this game. Now, I'm sure you're going to tell me New Donk is good, but there's no platforming sections. It's not designed. That's what makes Mario games so great. Also, the post game is a dumpster fire. Just showing me the map is lame and I want to do the new moons, but all the challenges sucked and I got excited about them, but none of them were meaningful at all. Also, I didn't like the soundtrack and I found it disappointing. It's one of my least favorite what? Mario games what? near the bottom for 3D Mario for me. However, I would like wow. to that I would like really? it to be I would like it to be number five. Frankly, if it gets above Red, uh, if it gets above Ocarina of Time, I want it above Red Dead at number three. This is what I feel. Even Mario at its worst is still better than 99% of games at their best. I'm still trapped in the closet. Can someone help me? Love those and Mel. There you go. Now we can't complain whenever it comes to the re-rank episode. Brandon. You'll complain about that voice, but. Oh, I awesome. love that voice. <laughs> I thought he was here. Yeah, you would, you would think. I also want it at number three, by the way. So. Oh my god. That he had terrible points though. That was terrible. I yeah, did hear so fucking good. good. <laughs> but <laughs> the music is so good. What the fuck? The music yeah. is amazing. He said he said that there were good tracks like the one that named this podcast but over of all he found it lacking. Um I, I, no. No. No, we're not going to allow it though. Here's the thing. Mario Odyssey has the best controlling Mario I think I've ever had played in a video game. Yeah. It, it oh is, yeah, though. easily. It's incredible. It, and that on a fundamental level, locomotion, the jump is what Mario in many ways innovated at the very start of its inception and it is the best it's ever been in Mario Odyssey. Like you said, the world, the variety, the fact that that it is still distinctly Mario, but you don't see a toad until the end credits not named Captain Toad, God rest his soul. And, and we didn't even mention Cappy. Cappy. We didn't even talk about it. This the is whole mechanic. The whole new mechanic, yeah. Sometimes I think about how this game unveiled. We saw a new Donk City. We didn't know about the capture mechanic of this game until three months later, at e- five months later at E3, right? Yeah. I think that that is such, like, that at the core, there is this, per- you know, the best Mario has felt in any game, and then on top of it is one of the most brilliant, I don't want to call it a gimmick, but mechanics that they've introduced for probably a singular Mario game um in three in the 3d uh, scope of mario right in in 3d mario games just every level these different capture mechanics that are you know i just the plant that stretches his legs i love so much they're all just really (laughs) good to control too they all feel real fun Mm -hmm. there's and and some people say the moons aren't meaningful right some say you know there will just be one that's just give me moons right but this game there's over 800 right and the thing is it's not about any like specific one moon and doing that, even though there are some that I do remember specifically, right? The Sonic Adventure level where the T-Rex is chasing you on the scooter. That moon's great. I love that moon so much. That yeah, was awesome. You know, just li- little fun ones where you're like sitting on the bench and the guy's like, no one's ever sat and talked to me before. You can have this moon. Like, I love that. Like, yeah. yeah, those are really cool. There's such variety to it that that all 800, you so rarely repeat them. And and that is insane in a game that, you know, really, you could, you could, there's there's sort of, four buttons right there's jump throw cappy and then like crouch or do a dive and like that's it you know like they can get so much out of so little and that is so much of the brilliance of mario and in particular what nintendo can pull out of a video game 
It's got to be number three. Mm-hmm. It's got to be number three. I mean, you I guys was, are arguing was, against yourself because higher. nobody else is here to. Uh, <laughs> no, we just want to talk about how good this video game well, is. Here's <laughs> the thing: I'd put it higher. I, I would put it higher. I would put it higher. I, but dare but I say settled. what? I mean, I mean, one and two. What is above it isn't settled because it's, it's it's still Breath of the Wild and Super Metroid tied. Are we gonna make it a three-way tie? I I got an even better idea. Put it above the two. Worse. Do you want to put it? Why don't we just say they're both worse and put it at number one? Uh, I, Brandon, I like your idea. (laughs) It's so good. I don't know. No, I can't. I can't join you on this. I can't join you on this. I think Breath of the Wild's better. I think Breath of the Wild's better. I don't. No, I, I I don't think so. Case to be made. Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, we could put it in the three-way tie situation, but I would make. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want, I don't that. want that. I would keep. I would keep it at this three. Is I would a keep mistake. it at three. I would keep it at three. <laughs> like, it's which so... one sold more on the on the Switch? Oh, please. <laughs> no, but like Mar- no. Super Mario Odyssey felt like it really went back to its Super Mario sixty four roots and did it so well. Like they mm-hmm. fucking nailed it, like with the like we said with the controls, the open worldness, the exploration, everything. Like is like and like Brandon said, like we it's been fun throughout the whole experience. Of the game there was never a dull moment playing that game. No, the boss battle was never too. like there Every, wasn't even. A I would say the hint moments. puzzles like, are bad. The hint puzzles on the on the dark side of the moon where they give you 15 of them and you have to like take the screenshots with the switch and then go into the menu and then try to figure out where they yeah, are. I mean, I mean that was pretty... Kind of cool. There's too but... many. What? There, uh, th- that, one, that one level is like 20 of them. It, genuinely. It's a lot. Um, it's the one where you also have to do the boss rush. Uh, you know, there's also a lot of Korok seeds. There is a lot of Korok seeds, yeah. but the Korok seeds are never presented as a thing are... you all of. You don't get rewarded. I mean, you don't get rewarded for either, for getting really for getting all of the moons. Um, but I yeah you do you get a picture you do get the picture and that picture yeah you nice. get a picture yeah but I mean but why, you know I I think that the idea is that for me Breath of the Wild like is it is both new while capturing the spirit of the original Legend of Zelda and that's the thing that like I think that Mario Odyssey very clearly is is in the style of Super Mario sixty four and it's still in the path of and it's my favorite Mario game of its type it's my favorite Mario game but I think the Breath of the Wild I, I have such a strong affection for the it, it evoked emotions in me that like no other game has where Mario Odyssey was like a an improvement on things that I that I already wanted out of Mario, you know, and so that's why I would put Breath of the Wild above it. Hmm. I mean, fair. I still think I'd put it. I, I don't know. I, I still think it's uh, Mario Odyssey deserves number one. I, it's a very good game. I, I feel like if Saf was here, that would be. Uh, I really wish Saf didn't. He, he died if midway through. If only people didn't die. <laughs> if only people didn't die. Muzumo got trapped in the closet on purpose, but Saf was also trapped in there with him. He, he wandered in before we locked the door. Um, I did it. It was me. It was Brandon, the subterfuge. It was, it was me, Muzzy. It was me all along. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, right now it's like tied. Right? I mean, like. Bills, I assume you want to keep it below Super Metroid. Yeah. Yeah. But I haven't I, played I, this game, yeah, he, so I have no idea. He, he's never even played it. He's never even played it. He doesn't even know how good it is. <gasps> oh my god. god. <laughs> well, if Will's saying it's less than Breath of the Wild, then I think I mean, Super Metroid is better than Breath of the Wild, and what the hell is the point? <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. He has played Breath well, of the Wild. you know what? Here's the thing. I'm willing to put it at number three. Ills, before the next re-ranking episode, you better play this game. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I can. Uh, yeah. Muzzy in Saf. I said, I'm sorry. Stupid Muzzy in Saf <laughs> uh, will be around for the, the re ranking as well. So maybe Odyssey deserves it when uh, the re ranking episode comes up. And when we settle this debate, it will be close, I think. We'll be getting close to the re rank, so it won't be too long. And one and two, one and two will be settled by that time, so we'll have more of a distinct picture. So right now, there's no way I'm going below number. Fucking three. No, brother, I'm Plus. with you on that one. Strong, strong Odyssey. emotions on, on that. Fucking incredible game. Super. If you haven't played it, go play that game. Get a Nintendo Switch. Get your girlfriend's boyfriend to buy you a Nintendo Switch. Go play it. Best final sequence in a Mario game, and that's that's saying something. Um, yeah. So there we go. It is, 
It, probably the best Mario game of all time. Yeah. Easily. Whoa. Going crazy. <laughs> Other people would not say easily, but the four of us here right now. Uh, so yeah, so there we go. Number three on the list, though. You know, who knows where the potential path of this one in the future. Gosh, that's exciting. Super Mario Odyssey. Uh, you know, the Switch has had a pretty good run when it could, it, it, you know, potentially could be getting one and two, one, or at least two of the top three games are uh switch games but also has three in the top 10 right now not too bad almost almost four uh octopath very close but we uh that is the list we've locked it in that is the podcast for this week uh ill since you did not have a lot of uh, chances to to (laughs) to to opt in on the list you had to deal with a lot of potentially scary moments with it getting to number one uh i think you've you can you can have the final phrase, but uh, while you think on that, let me tw- uh, plug specifically twitter.com slash jumpupsupercast where you can get updates on all the stuff that we've been doing, including the Game Club, a game that we've been playing, Incredible Crisis on the PS1. Uh, it's going to be a weird episode for a weird game. Going to talk about stuff about it, so look forward to it. Next week, we are still going to do a podcast on, uh, in the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, the exact date we have not fully determined yet depends on who is available when because of the holiday season, but it'll be really a Thanksgiving episode. I think just, uh, just a real treat yeah. uh, for everyone. It'll be one to, to get, gather the family around the yeah. radio. And, uh, listen to we'll make staff not swear on that episode. Uh, so the, so the kids can listen. Family friendly. Um, yeah. Also, I guess while, before we go, I want to mention, we mentioned about settling the, Breath of the Wild Super Metroid debate. We're going to do that. We have a date set. It will be a structured debate. We will be trying to find a panel of impartial judges that will hear out each side's case for the game uh, as best as they can. Uh, And it will be on the anniversary of this podcast, which will be in January. So... Uh, maybe not January. When was it? I don't know. I don't remember the exact day we started the it podcast. Was Jan- it was January. It was January. I don't know the exact day. Yeah. But we will we will look forward to that then. Go listen to the first episode and see the first date. See how far we've come and plan your calendars accordingly. Um, so there we go. That is the podcast for this week. And without further ado, Ill's your final phrase. Uh, we did it for the memes. <laughs>